All right, everyone, welcome back today. In, uh, um, I don't know what day it is because I've already lost track of when I'm filming versus what day it is. I'm filming ahead of time, obviously, because I have to have these online at the right time. Uh, regardless, uh, we're going to finish up perturbation theory and then go into something called variation theory, which is pretty interesting. Variational theory is how modern software works when you're trying to do calculations on uh, atoms, molecules, materials, you're actually using a variational theory approach. So we're going to cover that, uh, actually I think starting today. And then after that, uh, we don't have, we only have enough time for maybe one or two more subjects. So uh, we have to get into the, the practical computational part. So we may start on that maybe uh, next lecture. So that will be more interesting. Uh, I'm going to have to film like screenshots of uh, MATLAB, so I'm going to be just typing on MATLAB and you just follow along on that. So it'll be kind of easy. And I'll probably give some model, I'll give you each a different model problem for your final exam. Maybe one more homework if there's time, but I, I'm just a little crazy. All right, so uh, I don't want to say too much about last time. Well, hold on, let's just review. So, so we're still on, we are still on perturbation theory, but we're going to do a different type of perturbation theory today. Perturbation theory. And uh, let's see here. Um, obviously, uh, the first order correction to the energy, which is really all that people use this for, to be blunt. And, and we see that it's, the simplest possible, the simplest possible um, result, which is just do the expectation value, do the expectation value with the new potential. Um, so cool, and we worked a hideous problem last time, but I, of course, as I said uh, last time, um, I want to remind you of how wave functions for atoms work. And molecules, of course, are composed of atoms, so it's just kind of more of that. And even for helium, you could see that, you know, we only, we only did one potential. Um, we didn't even try to do kinetic energy. We're we'll <laughs> probably going to do that today or, or next time. Um, but we can see how these get out of hand really quick. And why you want to use CAM software, you want to use third-party software, Gaussian games, Chem, you want to use those to do these calculations because there's no way you're going to want to program these yourself. All right, so the point of this is though, remember I, I gave a, one reason why you want to do this because for, for atoms, because of electron electron interaction, you can't actually solve the wave functions, so you're, always, you're basically always using a perturbative approach. Even in that CAN software I mentioned, QCAM, Gaussian, whatnot. Um, you were using hydrogen-like orbitals for atoms, and which, which are not correct. Uh, and then you're just calculating um, potential, I mean, total Hamiltonian, whatever. You, you just calculate that irregardless of the fact that you're really not working with the right, right wave functions. The other thing to think, that in terms of how do you think correctly when you're working with molecules, which you're always working with molecules, and quantum mechanics is always the right description. You can think of molecules interacting with each other, so think about how their unperturbed wave functions, um, think about the energy of that interaction, you know, with using the wave functions that you already have, right? So in what you're doing is you're doing this. So again, quantum, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think you're going to need to whip out these equations in your mind every time you're doing an experiment, but you do need to, it, it, you do need to have the way you think and approach problems and, and data analysis in this way, even if it's subconscious. So I find this formula to be by far one of the most useful things rattling around in my head every time I'm thinking about what my data is trying to tell me. Um, okay, now, I mentioned that People don't actually, rarely do people bother to calculate, um, um, how do I want to put this? Um, uh, let me do this to first order. Okay, so when I have a perturbation, 
and I want to um, go beyond the zeroth order description of the wave functions. Uh, and of course, let's just say that we're doing the ground state. So what you do is you take the ground state. So this is like the exact solution, but, but I'll only go to first order, the first order correction. Uh, so ground state plus first order correction. And um, so uh, again, I'm always using the ground state as the example. So for all states that are not the ground state, um, you have a weighing factor, uh, ground state unperturbed, excited states unperturbed. Yeah, basically this, right? Uh, and then we have an energy difference minus the ground state energy. And you're adding in the unperturbed uh, excited state wave functions. And as I mentioned, um, you technically would need to do this for the infinite number of states in the basis. Uh, obviously, this uh, denominator gets very big, and so you only would want to do this for the first couple of excited states. Um, and again, one of the things to think about is when your molecule is perturbed by your experiment or by its interaction with another molecule, you can kind of think about what it's doing by thinking about how those excited states might get involved. So like, if the bonding of a molecule is perturbed by something, an interaction with another molecule or some field or NMR or, or whatever, you want to think about maybe like, well, how would the unoccupied orbitals get involved, right? So you can see how you can think more than just, you know, here's this equation, oh well. It says that a state when perturbed is like its, its ground state, but maybe like the excited states. The, the like, like if this is a bonding orbital, this is an unoccupied anti-bonding orbital, and this is getting involved in the action, right? You see, you see how that's getting in your head? Um, okay, anyway, so that's just a reminder of what we did last time and why I was telling you perturbation theory is far more important than just here's some wacky equ equations for when I have a Hamiltonian that's too hard. It tends to be presented that way, but if you start, you know, like the scripts that I just mentioned, it's way more valuable than that. Okay, now here's a subject. I'm not going to spend much time on this. It's in your book, um, but... I don't see this come up often, and, um, and so I'm not going to spend much time on it. <laughs> okay, so what happens when you have a degeneracy, right? So we're trying to, um, we're not going to work on the ground state system for like a hydrogen atom. We're going we're gonna to perturb a hydrogen atom, and we need to think about how it affects a 2p state. Okay, so the problem is, is that uh, a 2p uh, x state, right? So you've got to add in all the other non-2px, uh, yeah, all the non-2px states, which includes a 2py and a 2pz, for which, which we have the same energy, or, or even a, a 2ps. 2ps, 2pxy, and z, they all have the same energy in a hydrogen atom. So when you're doing perturbation theory, you may run into a problem where your, you know, the other states than the one I'm trying to fix have the same energy, the definition of that, that's the definition of degeneracy. What happens when you have a degeneracy? Right, this doesn't work, and it doesn't work, right, because that is zero, and that blows up. If that blows up, then you can't really trust that either. First order perturbation theory is clearly not working. So what you do is you use what's called degenerate. Degenerate perturbation theory, and again, I have actually never seen anyone invoke the need or use of degenerate perturbation theory in, um, in any professional talk I have ever seen. Um, and so again, the, the, the reason this comes up is if you're doing, um, you know, like a PX, PY, PZ state, that's, that's an example I'll use. I'm actually going to... I'm mostly going to show you, this, uh, show you how to work this via example, which is probably more useful than anything. Okay, here's the trick. You can't avoid that being zero. 
right? Ugh. What you can do is you can make that zero. So then you got zero over zero. So what you want is you got to work with that. Make make the perturbation among the degenerate states. Make that zero, and then the bottom part doesn't matter either. Okay. Now whether you look in that. Um, Actually, I didn't print out anything from that other textbook I have. Or if you look at the textbook you have, or if you look online for any derivation of degenerate perturbation theory, it's just, it just kind of you know, starts here and it goes on and on and on and on. The thing is, I don't see the value of wading through that nightmare. It's not that hard to understand. It's just that the end the, 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 the final algorithm is simple. In fact, it's easier than this, which is kind of awesome because it sounds like it's harder. Uh, let me tell you what you do. Okay, so here we are. Here's what you do. Uh, you diagonalize. Oh, I'm going to spell that anyway. You diagonalize the V matrix, so I'm going to put in the matrix with degenerate states. Okay, now we've gone over diagonalization a zillion times of Hamiltonian this, that, and in talks, you, in papers, you always hear about diagonalizing, diagonalizing, diagonalizing. Of course, what it means is that you're finding the eigenstates in, in the corresponding energies. That's what that means. Now, what I like about this, the only reason I wanted to go over this, even though, I, again, I have never seen anyone use this before in a talk, is that it gets home a little bit more about the importance of diagonal, 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 but it shows you a little bit more about what a, how, to, how to think about basis. And so, in this case, um, we're going to, so, so let me show you what this means. Uh, of course, the energies, energies are the first, order correction. And the states are the new states. And I'm not even going to write that down. It's too simple. I'll, I'll work an example. Okay, the example I'm going to work is going to be called the linear stark effect, which is just a mag um, I said magnetic field. It's an electric field. So you put something in an electric field, and um, states, degenerate states are perturbed. Um, so uh, uh, let's see, we are going to, um, uh, so what are we going to perturb? We're going to uh, perturb H atom, H atoms again, but it won't be nearly as bad as last time, H atom P orbitals. And we're going to mix that, those are going to be two, yeah, two P orbitals. Uh, we're also going to mix the 2s state. Uh, the 2s state is going to get mixed in as well. Um, I'm not throwing that in just for the heck of it. It's actually essential to the problem. Okay. Now, one thing I'm going to go over is um, uh, a set of units that make calculations easy. I'm going to do that next time. Um, but for now, let me point out that the unperturbed Hamiltonian, uh, okay, I'm doing an H atom minus H bar squared over 2 me. Uh, anyway, I was just writing those notes. I was just writing those notes. Um, um, what, what am I doing? On uh, how to use different uh, sets of units, like atomic units, where H bar is 1 and ME is 1. It's really useful. I, I won't do it now. Uh, I'll do it soon though. Uh, so 4 pi e naught, that thing I kept screwing up. Okay, so that is, well, that h bar is too small. That it needs to be bigger. It's not the same font size. Okay, so um, that is the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And of course, now we need to know what the perturbing potential is. And um, this is going to be. Um, we're going to have a dipole and times an electric field in the z direction. And uh, let us, <clears throat> um, 
Here, that one. Um, here. Let me let me just write down what this is going to look like, and then I'll need to um, explain this a little bit more. I know I just wrote this down. You're like, what, why is that? That. Am I missing a minus sign? Um, okay. So let me explain this turning potential uh, because we're going to work with it, and it's probably not too transparent. Let's see. Um, first thing to note is. Um, Let's look at an H atom. Okay, so we got a, we got a, a, a proton, neutron, whatever. We've got a proton. I guess yeah, it doesn't have a neutron, does it? Okay, and it's got an electron at usually on average about a four away. So good, for, good for you. Okay, now any given instant in time. You know, we don't think of. Uh, things in S states being circular, circularly symmetric. They, they shouldn't have dipoles, but they can have instantaneous dipoles, right? That's where London forces, dispersion forces come from. So at any given moment, oh, it bothers me that the circle isn't lying through the center. There we go. Okay. At any given moment in time, you've got a positive and a negative charge at a certain distance apart. And uh, so therefore, it has a dipole. Um, so let's just now call that R. Uh, so the dipole moment, which we usually call this mu, is uh, charge times distance. Uh, sorry, delta delta q. Uh, but usually things are neutral. So if you've got you know a plus and a minus, uh, it, it would be bizarre if they weren't the same charge. Right? It's it's really rare to come into a situation where you have a an object where the plus and the minus don't you know, are, are overall neutral. Um, ions are really not that common in nature. Okay. Okay, so that's what's going in here. And then easy is just the electric field, which you, you know, you're going to add, you're going to add some plates. I give it a little, a little slash there to, to say that it's directional. And so it's in the Z direction. Okay. Now, the last thing to note is that, um, let's see, how do I put this? In, this is, this is a, something you would learn in group theory. Um, oh, but what, what am I saying? But in spherical coordinates, it all works together. Whether, you, whether you're thinking of group theory and, and character tables, or whether you're thinking in terms of um, uh, spherical coordinates, cosine, Cosine is basically C. So that's why I use cosine. But now let me also point out that if the dipole was completely 90 degrees, the electric field is not really perturbing it, right? So what's well, cosine of 90 degrees? Um, zero, right? Now if the dipole is, is in line, is, is lined up with the, uh, the electric field, then that's like the strongest interaction you could have. So cosine of zero is one, right? So, so this actually makes sense. If the dipole is perpendicular to the electric field, they're not really interacting. There, there may be a torque, there is a torque on it, but the energy, you would say that that's, there's no energetic interaction. And then if you're 180 or zero degrees, you're either going to be plus, you know, plus or minus in terms of the energy. And so that makes total sense. So there's multiple ways to look at this, but, but there you go. Okay, last bit, last bit of course is you want to think about, um, obviously what I'm thinking is that all the action is going to be in the PZ. Uh, so this is hydrogen. The PZ orbital is clearly going to be the one, you know, it's lined up with the electric field. I don't expect that the, um, what is this, that's the X and then the Y. The Y, I don't expect that. Those are, just like, just like how I mentioned, like if the dipole is 90 degrees, there's no interaction. Uh, PX and PY, now they're not going to, they're not, uh, they're not going to interact with this thing. Look how nicely I drew that. Anyway, they're, in the, they're 90 degrees. They're in the plane 90 degrees to that. Okay, now what I expect to happen is that I'm going to get an admixture of the S state. And another thing you should carry around in your head is if I start with two states, a P, uh, two, two S and a two PZ, I need to 
end with two states. So basically, it's classic hybridization. Right? So this is what you're going to get. Now, one way to think about this, I was always like, why does a circle and a dumbbell equal a big circle on the bottom or a big circle, a big circle on top and a big circle on the bottom? Uh, that's because remember phase? Now you keep hearing that word, right? Think of the phase relationship. If you augment the one on top but kind of suck density away from the bottom, you get that, or, or vice versa. So anyway, that's why those things look the way they do this. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to make the V matrix. And then we're going to um, work out what the matrix elements are. So the V, in, so the potential in the matrix form, which needs to be diagonalized, and this is the part, the reason I wanted to go over this was this part right here. Uh, and then I'm also still going to work with some hydrogen orbitals to just, just to stick it to you to be blunt. Okay, anyway. All right, so what, what goes in the matrix? Uh, the first column, and then of course, correspondingly, the first row, those need to be the same thing. That's the 2s state. So what I'm going to have is um, uh, 2s, v, uh, 2s. Okay. Now, um, you know what? I have to I have to kind of correct something here. Um, remember that the uh, 2p, uh, x, y, and z. Uh, are such that um, the, the 2PZ is, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the angular part of the wave function for 2PZ is um, uh, 1, 0, the spherical 1, 0, uh, L0, M0, uh, and Y for 2PX is, um, uh, 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 over square root of 2, and then two, uh, the 2PY. Two and you may recall that we talked about this at the very beginning of the class. Um, you, make, you make linear combinations of these. And again, we discussed this at the beginning of class why you do that. I'm going to undo that because this is a, a unnecessary complication. I just wanted to remind you that that's how P orbitals work. Okay. Now, now what is this deal? Okay, the next matrix element is 2s, v, 2p, 2p0. And we got 2p1, um, uh, 2p0. Now, obviously, this is just a complex conjugate of that. Um, oh, what am I doing? Um, you know what? You, you know what? You know what? No. I mean, I, I, let me do it right. Technically, uh, this is 2p0. Uh, that goes on the right. Uh, and, because I know that I know that the bras are always the same as you go down. That, that's how I know that. Um, And then, of course, the diagonal are, are easy. And on and on and on. Now, obviously, I'm not going to write the whole thing out because that's stupid. Uh, what I now need to do is start doing these calculations. And we're going to wander back into that nightmarish pit of hydrogen atom wave functions. And, um, <laughs> and we're going to. We're going to get back to spherical harmonic wave functions because why not? Uh, like I say, it's good for you to do this. Um, you know, sometimes I look at this stuff and I say, "There's no way I can figure all this out. It's too much." And then it's just a matter of taking my time, and, um, and I can do it. Uh, so it's it's tedious. I'm going to be writing things out for ten miles. Um, I guess I can start here. Anyway, okay, so let's do 2s r theta phi. Uh, we don't have two electrons, so we're not going to write r1 theta 1 phi 1. So we've got that going for us. And we know that that is, of course, separable. It truly is separable. And uh, we're going to use a spherical harmonic symbology, which is a y. Uh, of course, it's uh, uh, for an s state that's 0, 0. Uh, 
Um, sorry, I wrote that real small. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do is then write out, I, I, I Googled this, and you should already know that that's dangerous. Oh, I'm not going to write A0. I don't like the little zeros. It's a bore, right? It's uh, um, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, meters. Okay, so this is, um, oh, I, I should write this. This is the This is the 2S radial, and it has a node. The 1S state has no node. The 2S state has a node. That, that's how it gains kinetic energy. Uh, it's, it's a little bit shrunk, so instead of being minus R over A, it's minus R over 2A, and that makes it, um, sorry, that makes it, it's not shrunk, it's actually bigger. R has to be twice as big to have, um, to, to have it, lose amplitude. Okay, now what I've got are the spherical harmonics. I've got the uh, theta and I got the phi one. And like last time you saw this, one is the square root of one over square root of two, and the other one's the square root of two pi, which when squared is one over four pi, which eats the Jacobi. So anyway. Okay, now now here's the deal. As I mentioned, you gotta be real careful with normalization and make sure you understand when you Google something what it does. You gotta give yourself some test cases to make sure you know how to deal with this properly. Now, what I contend is um, that what I wanna see is, I'm not writing this out well, um, R squared, absolute value of the wave function squared, it's not complex, so that's easy. I need to see this is one. Okay, these wave functions were, I know they're a bunch of constants, but whatever. Uh, there's two integrals, one goes from zero to pi. That's theta, phi goes from zero to two pi. Uh, sine, theta, uh, uh, this thing, which we know is one over uh, four pi, uh, obviously. Oh, um, what is it, the outer? The outer one goes with the outer one, so theta goes from zero to two pi, and phi goes from zero to, theta goes from zero to pi, phi goes from zero to two pi, I think I got that right. Okay, now for certain, for certain that's one, I know that, so, I mean, this, this is obvious. Um, I know that sine, theta, d phi, d theta, I know that's four pi, so um, one over the square root of four pi squared, uh, clearly this is one. And um, notice what I've done here is I've double checked that it's not 4 pi r squared, just r squared is 1. So I, I, I make sure I know how to deal with this properly. Okay. Okay, so that's the 2s. Uh, I'll, I'll toss this up in a second. Let me write out the 2p. 2p0 stake. Um, and then I've got to. Um, um, 2p0. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, looking at my notes and wondering whether I've done them right. And again, I just Googled this. Notice that there's no node. Is there no node in this? No. No, this is the first of the p states, so there's no node in the p state. I can, I can tell because this doesn't give you a node. Uh, you still have an R over 2A. It's still longer. Okay, so. Um, um, okay, since it's not, sorry, <laughs> I had to stare at this for a while. Uh, okay, so remember that P0 uh, has, is that's the PZ state. And let's see, the B wave function is e to the um, M, m times phi, and m is zero, so there's nothing there except its normalization constant, which is um, apparently the square root of six over two. Uh, no, no, wait, sorry, sorry, it's one over, so for phi, for phi, it's one over the square root of two pi. Okay, then you got the theta, then you got the theta function, and the square root of six over two cos. Cos theta. Okay. 
And again, uh, double check. I double check the normalization. I double check that um, that this. And I double checked. I double checked it the same way the normalization is one. So I can't emphasize that enough that um, that that is that you got to double check that, that you're you're dealing with this correctly. Because uh, you know that once you have the wave functions defined in Mathematica, then then you can integrate it. All you have to do is put an operator in between and hit go, and it makes it pretty easy. Okay, so now that I got those wave functions up there, uh, I know you can't really fully see that on the video, but um, you have them on your notes. Okay, now I'm going to do the matrix elements and heads up. Uh, notice I did not write uh, 2p1 or 2p minus 1 uh, because, and I, and I also shortchanged the matrix with the 2p1 and 2p minus 1. I didn't write those matrix elements down. Turns out they're 0. Right, so, uh, so we're going to start simplifying things. Okay, so let us do, uh, which one am I going to do first? Um, um, I might as well go ahead and tell you, again, with these, with, these, um, uh, with these wave functions, you can already figure out two, uh, a couple of things like 2s, v, 2s, 0, uh, 2s, um, v, 2p1 or minus 1. Oh, let me write that bigger. 1 minus 1 or 0. Uh, and also uh, 2p0, v, 2p1 or minus 1 or 0. So our, uh, our matrix is looking like this. So those p my, uh, plus one and p minus one that make it bigger, uh, they're all zero. And you can, when you have that situation, when you have a matrix like this and you have zero, 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 you can just shave those off. They're not going to affect the calculation of the eigenvalue. Um, that I, I know that that comes out to be kind of useful sometimes. Okay, so. The matrix elements, and again, so there's no need to work it out because we're, we're going to do plenty. Uh, again, I guarantee you that these guys are, are zero. Only the combination of a 2s and a 2p0, which is a 2pz, only those are, are going to be non-zero. So let's work those out. Okay, so we're going to have uh, the strength of the electron, the strength of the electric field. That's not energy. That's the strength of the electric field uh, right there. Um, volts per centimeter, uh, volts per meter, and okay, volts per meter. Those would be the proper units. Okay, we're going to integrate the 2s. Okay, R. Um, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, so Z, sorry, sorry, sorry. Z in spherical coordinates is R cos. R cos, right? So there you go. Sorry about that. That was a, a stupid me. I'm never going to get this perfect. Again, I, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that it's only this matrix element, only the 2p0 with the 2s is going to contribute. Okay, so there's what the R part, the radial part, is going to contribute. And um, it turns out that this guy. Whenever you're doing any of these atomic this or that, the radial, which is so important for calculating the energy, almost never, you're never going to run into zero with this. It's always in the angle parts that no matter what kind of problem I've ever run into, all the action, all the um, things that give you selection rules are always in the angles. Okay, so we've got sine theta. Part of the Jacobian. I've got y. Um, I've got here's here's. Um, oops, sorry, folks. Yeah, I just blanked out there for a second. Uh, okay, so this will be 
uh, I just had to think about what's what. Um, I, I got confused because I thought I thought I was doing like last time that there would be not three integrals but six. Um, no, no, that's when I have that's when I have two electrons, right? I get a set of integrals for every electron. So the last time that was nightmarish because I had six electrons, uh, six six integrals, three dimensions for two electrons. It's six. I only have one electron. There's only three integrals, one for radial and two angles. That's why I've been a little up there. Okay, anyway. Okay, so let's do the uh, wave function, the angular wave function for the 2s state, which is L0, and of course M has to be 0, L of 0 for an S. And now we've got cos, and that comes from the uh, electric field uh, perturbing uh, potential. And then I've got the wave function for 2, 0, which is 1, 0. I'm sorry, for 2p, 0, L of 1, uh, M of 0. That's by definition the 2p, 0 state. And I've got the theta, the, no, the phi, the phi is the inner, the theta is the outer. Um, can't really mess that up. With, I, I want to get it right, but in Mathematica, you are more explicit there. I don't think you can mess that up. Uh, anyway, and so then of course I did it with Mathematica. Uh, I, I defined the functions like up there, double check they're normalized, because I'm probably going to do something like this yourself. You, you need to be able to do this. Double check that it's normalized. Then I just plugged in uh, the functions in R anyway. Right, you know how to do this. This isn't hard. And what you end up with is um, um, E, E, just constants, uh, minus 3 square root of 3 a um, a not uh, the, a board makes sense because without the R, you get the number one, which is units. Uh, it has no units. Um, but you're calculating like it's like the average R between those two states. So I should have units of length, and so I do. Okay, now what's this deal? Again, um, okay, this is one over the square root of uh, four pi. Um, and this, this is, it, yeah, what am I saying? I, I have it right up there. I just, I just gave it to you. What's wrong with it? Um, this ends up being minus 1 over the square root of 3. Again, thank you, Mathematica. And therefore, the perturbing potential uh, here and here, it is uh, minus 3 uh, charge of an electron and coulombs, strength of the electric field, uh, times a bohr, bohr radius. Oh, but here I can actually, you know what? Those are a bunch of constants. So, um, so there's the, the matrix, right? So you just put the, pull the constants out of the matrix. Uh, and there you go. Um, oh, here, I mean, <laughs> I'm right here. So I plug that into MATLAB. And you're going to be doing this actually pretty, pretty soon. I plug this into MATLAB and I say, hey, MATLAB, what's the eigenvalues? And it says, they are minus plus. Okay, so the ground state is minus and the first excited state is plus. And guess what? It's just three. It's, it's the same as the elements, um, E times A. Okay. So, okay, so what you get out of this is that the 2s and the 2p0, the 2pc states mix. And you know they mix because they're the only ones that are that have non-zero matrix elements in the perturbing potential. The 2px and the 2py are not involved at all, and that makes sense. Or you know, 2p1 and 2p minus one. Anyway, we're going to have a degeneracy between 2s and the 2ps. That's going to be that's going to have um, a perturbation uh, that drives one of the states down and the others up. The last bit is to figure out what the states are. But again, yeah, let's see if you play around with matrices a bunch. Uh, what you would see when you have such a simple, such a simple uh, setup like this: uh, zero, one, one, zero. The states are just a 50-50 mix of one and the other. So uh, again, um, you can have MATLAB, Mathematica. You know, spit out the eigenvalues, which I, I had it do because I wasn't too confident about that. But when it comes to the eigenstates, the eigenfunctions, um, um, that I, I, I just know that one off the top of my head. Uh, and that ends up being 
Um, so you have a plus minus two states, uh, one over the square root of uh, one over the square root of two, two s. And the way you know that is um, this is two s and that's two and two pz. So uh, MATLAB will have some maybe some weird symbology, but um, but this is, this is what you get. 2p0 or 2pz is the same thing. There you go. Okay. Now, with this information and the energies, I can tell you exactly what happens, which is, it goes like this. So we've got four states that are degenerate, 2pz, 2px, and 2py, which are not um, disturbed. So you're going to add a, uh, an electric field in the z direction. Okay, so the 2px and 2py are not disturbed. They're uh, energetically the same. Remember that this is, uh, what I'm really saying is 2p, um, sorry, yeah, the 2p1, uh, one, one of the 2p1 minus 1 states are not perturbed, but X and Y are linear combinations of those, which again we covered at the very beginning of this core of the class when we talked about particle in the sphere. I know that was a while ago. Um, okay, we're going to have one state go down in energy, which is the plus state. Um, so plus, which is a um, uh, 2s plus uh, plus 2pz. And then we're going to have a state go high in energy, which is the minus state. Uh, remember, the energies are, you know, they go down for the plus state and they go up for the minus state. And this is 2ps minus 2pz. And here's, here's that state. Okay. So you split the degeneracy and, um, and you get new wave functions. And that's really about it. Um, I know I'm a little bit uh, but yeah, this is all it comes down to, and uh, and you can see that compared to what we did last time, this was actually way easier, isn't it? I mean, I think that's fair to say. And um, yeah, that's really all there is to it. This is the classical example. Uh, anyone who, whenever you learn perturbation theory, degenerate perturbation theory, we always do this problem because I mean, it's just not that hard. And you can repeat these calculations. I may put it on a homework or an exam or something like that, so you may not have a choice. Okay, with that, I see I have five minutes. And in the next five minutes, I'm going to cover a variational theory, and then we're going to, um, um, yeah, I forgot what today is, today is Wednesday. Um, I'm going to introduce variational theory. And then, uh, then, and then, and then, I'll finish it up next time, and then we're going to start on the, the practical computational part of this class, which is all, which I, I'm not aware of anyone ever teaching this stuff, which I think is hideously stupid because, you know, I, I do this for a living, as, you know, as someone who does research for a living. What I'm going to show you how to do is something I apply in almost every publication I have, and one that just came out just um, a few days ago involves some things I did with MATLAB and calculating wave functions using the methods I'm going to show, not, not what I'm going to show you right now, but what I'm going to show you afterward. Again, the, the practical computational part of this class. Almost never taught, but I think that's crazy because this, you might actually be able to use this. Okay, anyway, so that's that's what comes after this part, which is variation. There. Variational theory. Now, like perturbation theory, this is going to seem like, like this is what happens when you're not sure what to do. Uh, so, but if we're smart, we should always know what to do. So why am I learning this? Remember that there are lots of times, like, when atoms have more than one electron, where you, the best math, mathematician in the world, cannot exactly solve this. There's no analytical solution. There's no pen and paper solution. There's only numerical solutions. For anything that has more than two electrons, that's true, and that's everything. All right, so the variational theory, variational method, is how all software works. So I'll introduce this to you. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. 
But all software games, Gaussian, QChem, all the ones, you, there's another one called Orca, um, the Vienna one, VASP, um, NAMD, anyway, th there's so many softwares, they all do electronic structure this way. And, um, and we almost always do this, it's very hard to do anything other than ground states. So it's designed to give you ground states. And what you do is you use a trial, a trial wave function, and then you optimize it. And you do that uh, via minimization of the expectation value of the Hamilton. Okay, so let me give you a big picture idea here, and then we'll stop, and then I'll actually do some derivations in the next class, which will, for me, occur in five minutes. Um, okay. Obviously, you can't solve the Hamiltonian. You can't solve the Hamiltonian for molecules because they contain more than one electron. So you can write this sucker out. You got a trial wave function. Guess what that is? Those are atoms with linear combinations of atomic orbitals on the atoms. The atomic orbitals will be hydrogen-like. We know that those are not the right solution because we don't know what the solution is. But we're going to use them anyway. Now what we do is we put in fudge factors into the trial wave functions, um, like, like weighing coefficients. Uh, how, much, how much does this um, how much does this orbital, how much does this uh, atomic orbital contribute? And what you do is you calculate the expectation, you, you make an initial guess, and then you see what the energy is. You then take the derivative of the energy with respect to that parameter, right, and you set it equal to zero to find the, the lowest energy. What, what do I set this parameter to to achieve the lowest energy? And then you do that for all the all the parameters that have been built into the trial wave function, all the adjustable knobs, bells and whistles, everything that's been built into the trial wave function that can be adjusted is minimized uh, by taking the expectation value of the energy and setting the derivative equal to zero for that parameter. And, and just like you know, you learned in high school how to minimize a function by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. So I'm going to do an example. This is not how the calculations work. Uh, Gaussian games, um, QChem. This is not how they work, but it gives you an idea of how they work. Um, as I mentioned before, those softwares, you to learn those softwares, you have to take a different class than this one. They use, because, because they are trying to use trial wave functions to solve the Hamiltonian, the issues you run into that you need to understand are not really are not that important to quantum mechanics. They're more practical. They're more like what algorithms do you use? What kind of hydrogen-like wave function of, of, of orbitals do you apply to the atoms? You actually have several choices. Uh, what you do is you take hydrogen-like orbitals and you perturb them a little bit. Uh, and, and computational chemists they develop their own like like O oh, for for the metals in organometallics. I have worked on uh, um, a set of hydrogen-like orbitals that work really well. And then some other competing group said, well, I appreciate what you did, but we found that if you do it slightly differently this way, we find that these work pretty well. And this, this is kind of how that field works. So when you're working with those softwares, you tell it whose wave function sets you'd like to use. Uh, and the writers of the software, they have proprietary methods for solving uh, the expectation values of the Hamiltonian and for minimizing those, um, th those parameters. Uh, one of them is called DICE, D-I-I-S. D-I-I-S, that's the most famous one, direct iterative minimization of the subspace. Anyway, it, goes, it means something like that. Um, so anyway, that's how those things work. And uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. And uh, I'm going to derive the equations. And then we're going to do an example uh, with helium. <laughs> we're going to do helium again. It's not nearly as bad as last time. 
Uh, and then we're going to get into the computational part, the practical computational part. So I will see you next time, which for me will be in five minutes.